Welcome, everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about the Austin housing market, existing home sales, and home prices. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. It is wonderful to be here on the first day of summer. It is great to have you on the first day of summer. You're wearing like this very, um, I don't know, it looks very I know, summerish. I, I feel you. like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very summerish today. I think it was like three weeks ago, you were wearing a turtleneck sweater. So, you know, the- it's Oh, and God, nice... you know what? I, I literally cannot wear turtlenecks doing interviews. There's just <laughs> way too much drama happening with turtlenecks. And that was, everybody thought, where was I? And, you know, was I in Russia or something? Because I was wearing a turtleneck <laughs> in Southern California. And then a whole bunch of other stuff happened. So I am I might just put an end to all turtlenecks. <laughs> Well, yes, we do get a lot of comments when you wear turtlenecks, which I think is hilarious. So anyway, um, really a lot of news to talk about today. So we're um, recording this on Friday. So existing home sales uh, came out this morning. What was the big takeaway from that in your perspective? You know, when, when I think about existing home sales this year, and I go back to our article that we wrote in March, uh, for the February report, and you know, the, the, the headline kind of theme was that was have a, has existing home sales peaked for the year? And uh, we said, yes, unless mortgage rates fall, that was it. That is very similar to what happened in 2023. We had that one big, massive month-to-month -month print, and that was it because rates went up. So here, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think there's a lot of confusion with the purchase application data. And I think a lot of people who don't track purchase application data for a very long time might be confused because they see this double digit year over year decline in the data line. And they think that existing home sales should be trending in the mid to low three millions this year. And that's not the case. The, the, the purchase application data is a trend survey. And what we have here at Housing Wire, what we are going to uh, you know, showcase now uh, on the weekly trackers, we have a pending contract data line where we get to see how many homes go into contract for the current week. And that's not going to filter into the existing home sales data uh, uh, until months later. So our pending contract data has pretty much been positive year over year, not by a lot, just a little. So we're slowly moving lower, but we're not crashing in sales. And uh, to me, it's just, it's just this, uh, same theme as always in 2020, in, in 2022, 2023, and 2024. It's really rare for the U.S. to get below 4 million. It's especially rare now considering we have near 159 million people working and our demographics are good. Um, so it's I, I can understand why some people are confused. It's just a slow, slow decline. But it looks looks right if you kind of follow a weekly tracker and think that, you know, we had, we had about eight positive weeks in purchase application data. It filtered into two months of sales and we're slowly moving lower. And now we get to see, <clears throat> has the recent move in rates uh, helped purchase application data to stabilize the demand? So I think that's the thing is like, um, typically, you know, you always say that, you know, you're going to start seeing things slow down, right? After, after spring, I mean, as we, as in, in the seasonality, but the wild card here is rates, and we have seen that go lower. Now, now we're right around seven percent uh, for the last couple of weeks. You know, uh, this week uh, is the first time we've had back-to-back -back positive purchase application data prints since uh, mid-March. So, to me, we need weeks, right? You need duration. You can't have like one one week and one negative week. So, <clears throat> if we get you know, seven to eight weeks in a row, then we got something to work with. So let's talk about home prices, right? So that was one of the headlines that uh, you see some people talk about that like home prices, median home prices higher than ever, whatever. Where are we with home prices and are we where you expected? So one of the things that I've been trying to get people a heads up on is that last month and this month, the year over year, uh, price gains are going to be a little bit stronger than than what it's what it's trending at because we had a very low bar uh, in median prices last year, so we were actually negative year over year in the median sales price data. And I'm 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 never the biggest fan of median sales price, but that's the data we were working with. So 
on paper, it looked like the strongest year-over-year -year home price growth at all-time highs, which, as you can imagine, there's one group of people that are just like, what the hell is going on here? You know, <laughs> no, no, but um, just uh, realize that home price growth is cooling currently. You know, this is why we do the tracker, so everyone gets a heads up. And because it's cooling, and then now the comps are going to be harder going out for the rest of the year. We got one more negative comp next month, and that's going to be just barely negative. And then you're going to have uh, positive year-over-year -year comps to work with in terms of it's going to be harder to get that year-over-year -year price growth. Just by itself, that would cool down the, the data. But here, uh, inventory started to pick up uh, at, at the end of March, and the price cut percentages got to pick up. And remember, we're, we're months ahead of everyone, so it takes time to filter it into the data line. So price growth will, will cool down. Uh, um, and thankfully it'll cool down and just r remember that going out in the second half of the year. I, I think there's just so many people shocked because, uh, they see these, you know, uh, year over year inventory gains and these percentages and they're like, oh, here it is home prices. And it's like all time highs that were like almost in July, you know? So I, I think there's just such a frustration and this is the problem when guys don't read and they just make stuff up. And when you just make stuff up and you have no working models and you don't forecast and you don't do anything and you're just doom, we've seen some really, 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 really bad doom porn this year. Uh, and I, I think it just, it wears you on your soul that you think to yourself, I, I spend every day myself doom porn posting on in America and the world isn't as bad as the, how, it, how it looks. And, and dude, it's you. It's you. Go look in the mirror. It's not anyone else. You're 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 an idiot. There's nothing else to say about it. I mean, you wasted your life following zero brain dead readers and Russian trolls. It's, it's you got one life to live, and my encouragement is to just let it go. Right? You don't have to do this. Enjoy whatever life you have left with your family members and friends, and don't don't doom porn post every day. Give give it a rest. Give it a rest. So you and I worked on a story this week um, about the Austin home prices. So you were helping me dig into the data, into the Altos data that we have. And what we saw was that um, since 2020, well, since 2019, Austin home prices went from um, 374000 in in June 2019, again, median price, to 635000 in June 2022 which was a 69.7% increase. And now June this year, right, 2024, that number is, has since dropped 15%. And now it's about $569,000. But, you know, so yes, um, you know, the, the story on Austin has been like, oh, falling home prices and, you know, it's, it's quote, unquote, quote unquote crashing. But that number is still 52% higher than 2019 prices which is crazy to me. So even in, in one of the, you know, hot pandemic boom towns, and now as prices have come down, it, it's not like it went, it went so far down. And, and I asked you about that. I was like, why is that? You know, could we expect it to go back to 2019 levels ever? And um, love for you to, um, you know, what you said is that prices are sticky once they get to a certain, uh, you know, high range. So can you kind of explain that a little bit? Like, why is it that we're still 52% higher? So Austin was savagely unhealthy. I mean, vertical pricing is just for home prices is, is insane. So one of the things with Austin, and, and this is, goes back to the 2022 uh, uh, housing data. What happened in 2022 was like a historic event in home sales data. It literally had the fastest crash ever. It literally had the unbelievable crash in the second half of the year. And a lot of the pricing weakness that we've seen in some of these major cities that have not gotten back uh, to their highs came in that period. And then they're not, in a sense, crashing anymore. So one of the things that I, I, I would you know, if, if I had to force everyone to look at Austin right now, go look at the days on market. And when we saw real, real price weakness, you know, where we see that decline from the pre, the days on market is actually higher than what it is currently. So 
if you're thinking that prices have to get back down to 2019 levels uh, because you're at 2019 uh, 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 inventory levels, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And this goes back into the general 2022 uh, housing call. Remember that home prices were falling on a month to month basis pretty aggressively in the second half of 2022. But the whole theory was that home sales were going to stop crashing. And if that home sales stops crashing, then the velocity of pricing is going to shift. And in this sense, you know, demand stabilized, home prices started to increase from that point, And here we are today, all time highs. With Austin and some of the other metro areas that are not back to their all time highs, uh, you're going to need mortgage demand to grow and an influx of uh, migration buyers in that sense. So if you're looking, why aren't home prices crashing like they did in 2020? Well, it's not necessarily the 2022 marketplace anymore. Um, the velocity is different. You're, you're seeing inventory increase, you're seeing pricing softness, but it's just not that. So the question is, if rates fall 1% over the next 18 months, do you still have that mindset of bearish pricing if the days on market falls and if inventory starts to decline a little bit and demand picks up. So you wanna keep an eye on the weekly data for Austin, but to explain why prices didn't come back down to 2019 levels, that a lot of the weakness that you see in these major metropolitan cities that have not, I mean, it, there's not a lot of them, but the ones that have not got back to all time highs, uh, you just don't have that 2022 marketplace anymore where sales are crashing. In. Rates went from 3% to 7% in one year. And everyone that was in the market that day could not operate in a normal fashion, where now rates just aren't moving as fast. And everybody that lists their house has somewhat of an idea of what to expect. Uh, so the velocity is much slower. And hopefully that explains why prices are not falling another you know, 15% this year, even though inventory is increasing. And here's a good example. Our Altos data, we're, we're up well over 100% in inventory and prices are at all-time highs. So it doesn't necessarily mean that as, yeah, if inventory grows, that means that you're going to see price declines. Inventory grows seasonally every spring. It's the supply and demand equilibrium. Uh, and those those areas, you just have to, you, you, need, you need more mortgage buyers because if you don't have the migration or the cash buyers coming in, then you're stuck with the local wages, right? And the local wages tend to need mortgage buyers to drive that. So that's the one thing is that you don't have the demand there. You're stuck and we're all stuck at these low, very low levels of sales. So uh, uh, that explains why the entire country is already back to all-time highs in pricing. But these other places just don't have that mortgage kick buyer in there. Uh, uh, to push pricing up. And in, until that happens, you're going to see that softness where everywhere else, you just, the inventory is too low. The, even though demand isn't really growing in a big fashion, it's, it's the active listings that are just too low to uh, uh, give pricing weakness. And here's a good example. The NAR data today, um, the days on market is 24 days. 24 days means that we are in the third calendar year of the lowest home sales ever recorded in history. And I still can't get my 30 to 45 days on market. And I'm just like, oh, it is so frustrating. And that's normal. The 30 to 45 days in the NAR data is normal. And we're still, even with sales trending back down to uh, 4 million, we're still 24 days, right? So because of that, and another good example, I like to tell people in 2011, it was 105 days. In 2011, uh, the new listings data that we provide to everyone uh, was running at 250 to 400,000 per week. I'm not even going to get my, I, I mean, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. I still have, I think a few weeks left. I'm not going to get my minimum 80,000 uh, uh, a seasonal peak print, which I thought was the, just the minimum of this year. And it's not going to happen. We're going to have like 72, 73,000. So I'll be seven uh, K short unless something happens in the next few weeks. So it's just a different supply and demand equilibrium, but these markets are very expensive. 
right? So they're tying themselves to the local wages right now. So if you don't get that migration buyer out there, you're going to need lower rates. That lower rates needs to stem the uh, demand up there. And without mortgage buyers, what happens, Sarah? Inventory can grow. Yeah. Right. That's the whole higher rates. This is the whole Mike Simonson and myself going against the mortgage rate lockdown people. Right. Mike and I have a different reason for it, but it's the fundamental belief that inventory can grow with higher rates. My belief is that if you don't have the mortgage buyer in there, it allows inventory to throw. That's what it's looked like for 14 years. So these markets are just very expensive because they went vertical pricing. And if you go vertical pricing and you don't get that migration buyer, you don't get that cash buyer, you're relied on your local home buyer that needs lower rates. And this is why we're not back to all time highs here on pricing, but this is also trying to explain why hasn't Austin fallen another uh, 15 to 20% uh, if we have right. more inventory. So I think that's the thing, you know, um, Austin's sort of a, um, uh, a litmus test. You can look at it and decide, you can kind of put your narrative on it, right? Because you can look at it and one of, one of the narratives is like, we have more than 10,000 homes for sale in Austin right now, right? And and that's what our Altos data shows is that we do have a lot of homes for sale, as you said. But also, um, so so there's that. So, you know, you and I uh, know of uh, some sources who are like, they drive around homes, they see, see vacant homes that builders have, have uh, not sold yet, or maybe they have, they just don't have a sign there. And they're like, oh, everything's crashing in Austin. And, and there have been a lot of people who are like, you know, there's more than 10,000 homes for sale. The days on market now are 88, I think. Um, so that's back to like their normal uh, pre-COVID level. So you could, if, if you focus... Yeah, I Sorry. think it was 122 days in December. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So, so that was the peak. That was the like, like, you know, the days on market has fallen a lot on Austin, but it was falling from a level that was showing severe price weakness. So you have to look at that equilibrium out there and put all the variables together. So I, I think I... Uh, I, I think the biggest surprise is people just thought there'd be another 20% home price decline this year because inventory is growing. It necessarily doesn't work that way. You have to put all the equilibriums of all the pricing mechanisms in together, active listings, new listings, days on market, stuff like this. So for Altos, we have, we have so many data lines we could do with cities and zip codes yeah. that we give people uh, the proper way how to track uh, uh, pricing. Um, but uh, Austin to me is... Major building for years. Um, vertical pricing, never good. Never good when you see vertical right. pricing. Like when you see uh, Austin go up, that, that's never because you do not have that kind of buyer profile to keep going, right? So you're you're stuck with the mortgage buyers. Mortgage buyers need lower rates. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, uh, and that's that hopefully explains Austin. But I, I, I understand the... The surprise that prices have not dropped another 10 or 20 percent like some people thought it would happen this year well and i think you know we compared it to um other you know uh texas markets to look at what the median home prices were and i was surprised there because um of course south of austin you've got san antonio new braunfels at the at only 347 thousand. but i mean san san antonio while it does have a lot of Headquarters, while it has a lot going on, it's it's not Austin, right? And it doesn't have those big tech companies there, at least not yet. It's so um, but cheap. Even, I know. It's so cheap, Texas right? Is, I mean, for coastal California people, we're looking like, oh, my God. <laughs> that's not even a – that's like half of what a one-bedroom condo in my neighborhood is. You, you can get a nice house in San Antonio for, for about $400,000. But uh, Dallas, where, you know, I'm in, I'm in this area, um, we're still, you know, we have uh, our median home – Price is four hundred seventy four thousand nine hundred ninety, so almost four seventy five, right? And and Dallas is definitely seeing um, a lot of in migration. It's seeing huge job creation. Um, I outline it in the story, but uh, I just think that there's some different different things here. And the other thing is we we have a lot of flat land uh, that can be built on. Not like Austin's not expanding and building too, but um, just very different market. I, I think Austin is a very different market. It's the Austin market that I actually like just because the sellers don't have that much control. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, to me, it's any, any area. See, I, I look at housing economics differently than other people. Other people just care about price and they kind of prostitute themselves on internets about doomsday stuff. But I always look at 
the, any area that's at 2019 levels, because the city of Austin is going to be here for a very long time. It can't keep on going vertical pricing, right? We've seen this happen in, you know, Toronto and, and Vancouver and, and some of these other cities globally. You don't want that, right? So the whole, set, you know, team higher rates was to create a balance so things could calm down. And so I actually, any, any areas that are 2019 inventory levels, I enjoy because balance comes into the equation, yeah. right? Uh, um, and you, you have to realize the, the, the stock of homeowners in Austin are doing fine, right? You know, majority of the people that live there have bought homes, you know, before the pandemic. Uh, so th there's not this situational risk where you have massive underwater homes with exotic loan debt structures and anything, you know, it's, it's really tied to the, uh, 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 economic cycle with labor. But, uh, I, I, I just, I feel so much better about Austin now in the sense that they have choices, right? It's no longer, you know, prices are not escalating and every year that goes by wages grow every year that goes by, you get people moving in. And as long as you don't have escalation pricing for years and years and years, you don't turn to be coastal California. We do right? not need that in the middle want, of Texas. You don't want it. You don't want to yeah. be coastal California. I mean, it's just, I mean, we, we, we show, I showed that, uh, um, situation in, uh, our, our home prices in Irvine, California. You should never right. use Irvine, California for anything, but, uh, the cheapest new home here in Irvine, California was like, uh, like a one, a one bedroom, two bath. Uh, 1200 foot square foot condo is 1.1 million. That's crazy. that's one that's 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 the condo, and you don't <laughs> you don't want you don't want Austin to become coastal California, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, I'm that that was the whole process, process of team higher rates to try to cool this down. Uh, but I think I, I do understand how some people just naturally assume you'd have the same velocity price crash. You need sales to keep on going lower and people having to need to price cuts to bring that down. And that explains the 2022 data, especially the second half of 2022. But now, as you can see, on a national basis, it's not the case, right? You know, how do we get home prices back to all-time highs? It's June of 2024. Well, home sales are no longer crashing. Active inventory is growing. Right. The NAR data is 1.28 million. You know, normally it's between two to two and a half millions, but there's no crashing in demand. You know, our pending contracts are still slightly pessimistic. Different marketplace uh, this year than what we saw in 2022. But this year, unlike last year, inventory is growing. This is why I, I like 2024 better than 2023. Right. Uh, 2024 is a more balanced marketplace. Active listings are growing everything. And we have a buffer. Right. So there's a buffer in Austin, even even if when rates fall, let's just do a hypothetical rates fall one to one and a half percent over the next 15 to 24 months. Austin has more choices. Right. Yep. Austin, the America has more choices and we needed to create a buffer out there because, as we can see, we don't have escalation inventory. We're just trying to grind our way from, you know, these very low levels. If you're in housing. Everyone likes 2024 better than 2023. 2023 was the worst year for housing in so many ways. So yes, you're not alone on that. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, in the last couple of minutes here, you wrote um, a story you wrote up about, um, you know, are we seeing our housing permits showing recession risk? And really that whole, all of the data we got yesterday from, you know, housing starts, housing permits, give us, give us an overview. So we did the last podcast, we talked about it, you know, it was two days before the report and the trend was, you know, heading lower. So it, it wasn't a surprise that we have that data, but just, you know, it's such a unique cycle. Housing permits, housing starts are pretty much at COVID-19 recession lows. Residential employment has not lost jobs yet. Um, and one of the things I, I always like to show people uh, uh, on Twitter and X is that Residential construction workers for single family had already had a slow decline. It's picking up just slightly, but it's not back to the cycle highs in demand. But apartment, you know, and uh, uh, remodeling workers are still growing. So what we're seeing now is just every time we have a recession, these two data lines both move down together, right? Uh, permits and starts move down uh, uh, together. Permits move down, single family and, and apartment. So we're seeing that occur right now. 
So the question is, are we going to have another year where rates fall down 1% and the builders' confidence go up and they start kicking permits again? Or is this it? Is this the final dance? Because, you know, we're finishing some of these projects. It's just because it takes so long to close an apartment project, these people are, are still employed. Uh, 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 if you had, you know, normal times, you know, uh, and the completions were there, uh, you probably would have already lost some jobs. So it's it's one of these things where now, unlike the last, let's say, 18 months, we always had single family permits rising. New home sales are are still in an uptrend, right? Purchase application data for new homes sales are still slowly moving higher. But we we already have the apartment in uh, sector already in a recession, and uh, if demand doesn't pick up, because the the purchase application data for new homes are just working off of the active inventory right now. They're going to take those homes out of the marketplace. That doesn't mean the builders are confident enough to issue m- new permits, right? That backlog is still in there. So uh, it, it is. I, I I totally understand why so many people are confused because if you try to incorporate this data line in the last five decades and you didn't understand all the unique variables. You'd be lost. You'd be like, why aren't why aren't there you know jobs being fired? But just remember the backlog is there. The new home sales sector still has homes that they're working off. There's 98,000 uh, new homes available for sale that are completed. That purchase application data just kind of winds that down. They're just working off that backlog still. And now they feel a little bit less confident at issuing permits and permits are falling. But the multifamily, once those are done, the labor is not there. Maybe can these workers go to these government chips programs, manufacturing spending? Uh, we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But you have permits falling, you have multifamily permits falling, your housing starts a recession, and rates are still high. So uh, last two years we've had rates fall like one percent to help the builders feel better. But uh, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there when the ten year yield actually makes kind of a, a, a another noticeable move down with duration. And then if that happens, then the builder's confidence will pick up. And then if the builder's confidence picks up, they're going to issue permits. Why, Sarah? Because they're not the March of Dimes. They're not the March of Dimes. They're here to make money. So they're <laughs> going to they're gonna sell as their their homes as the highest profit possible and, and, and issue new permits. So uh, it, it's painstaking. I get it. Uh, trust me, I, I, I understand the confusion out there. But uh, we just have to micro needle look at these data lines, and I encourage people when I when I write those new home sales articles, I try to outline the monthly supply data, like how many are still in construction and how many hasn't uh, haven't even started yet. And we have a very historical high number of homes that haven't started yet. It's only one hundred and one thousand per the last new home sales report. That might not seem a lot, but that's near all time high. So it, it, it's tricky. Right, this is a very tricky cycle, uh, um, and if you're running old playbooks without understanding the new variables in the cycle, it, it's confusing. I get it. Okay, well, that's why we have you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for being on, and uh, we will definitely talk to you again soon. Pleasure.